coming up on Garden Talk. When you get open up that bag and it's loud, those are the terpenes. And those are volatile organic compounds. And that is actually what plants use to communicate. That is the plant's language. Go ahead and spread that in your garden and you're gonna see a huge increase in microbial diversity, which will then in turn increase your terpenes. Bacteria are gonna come up and they're gonna feed off of that nitrogen source. And once the green is gone, it becomes brown and that's carbon. And then the carbon feeds the fungus. It's amazing, it's a full circle of life there. The reason why you should be growing in living soil as organically as possible if not for the planet, for increased terpenes. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 82. In this episode, I interview Queen of the Sun Grown. She was on this podcast once in the past, episode number 30. And she talked about several different things in that episode, such as building up your native soil, IPM, composting, and a few other topics. Now she's back for another episode. In this episode, she talks about terpenes and tips on maximizing terpenes while gardening. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. AC Infinity is sponsoring this episode. My entire ventilation system is AC Infinity. I have their inline fan, ducting, and carbon filter. I love the controller with the temperature and humidity programming and having control of different fan speeds. This makes it so much easier to control my grow environment. And I can't wait for the controller 69 Wi-Fi version, which also controls their oscillating fans and grow lights. You can use discount code Mr. Grow It for any of their products on their website, acinfinity.com, or use discount code Mr. Grow It 15 if you're buying off Amazon. Spider Farmer is sponsoring this episode. Check out their new SFG300W LED grow light. This grow light has a bar design for an even light spread and covers a 3 foot by 3 foot area. It pulls 300 watts, uses 896 bridge lux diodes, and has an efficiency of 2.75 micromoles per joule. They offer a 30 day no reason return, and if a defect arises within 2 years, Spider Firm will provide free after sale service. Check out their website at spider-farmer.com or search for them on Amazon. Coupon code MrGrowIt5 will get you a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with a familiar face, Queen of the Sungrown. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for asking. So you're back for another episode. Uh, so happy to have you back. Uh, the last episode that we did together was highly liked and you revealed a ton of good information for the audience. I'll definitely have the first episode linked down in the description section below uh, and also have it in the outro card of this episode. So once you finish watching this episode, you can click on the previous episode we did together. But, uh, but yeah, that was a really, really good one. And uh, I don't know if you know this. I might have... I'm trying to think if I DM'd you this or not, but you inspired me to start composting. Yay! And I don't know if you remember <laughs> that conversation we had because I think I mentioned like I don't compost and like I'll never forget this is like it was like a flip of a switch for you. We were like, you don't compost and you like you you weren't like angry. It was more like a disappointment. <laughs> and it really hit me like, oh, I need to start composting. So I got, I made myself a vermicompost bin and I've been composting for almost a year now. So wow. uh, that's thanks to you. Yay. And this is what I'm trying to do here. Change people's perception and save the planet one compost pile at a time. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, we have a whole bunch of good topics to dive into today. Uh, but first, can you introduce yourself for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Yeah, definitely. I'm Alexandria Irons, aka Queen of the Sun Grown. Um, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube. I have a website, queenofthesungrown.com. Um, when we spoke last, I was still commercially cultivating medicinal plants. Um, but at this time, I've kind of changed gears 
and completely am focusing on education, consulting, and traveling the country, helping people um, grow cleaner quality medicine. Awesome. Some super exciting stuff there. That's really, really cool. So what are we going to dive into today? I know you want to talk all about terpenes, which is a topic that we haven't covered too much on this podcast. So I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about them. So yeah, just dive into it. What, what do you want to reveal to us today about terpenes? Well, so basically as a cultivator, I see the big paradigm of um, indoor versus outdoor. And we talk a lot about the influence of um, THC content versus terpene and the entourage effect and all of these different things come into play. Um, and you know, I've really been pushing this living sustainable, living soil, sustainable gardening, organic methods. And the reason why you should be growing in living soil as organically as possible, if not for the planet, for increased terpenes. Terpenes are responsible for the flavor, the smell. They are what we would describe as loud. <laughs> when you get open up that bag and it's loud, those are the terpenes. Um, those are volatile organic compounds. And that is actually what plants use to communicate. That is the plant's language. And so we can see increased terpene synthesis from plants by increasing biodiversity. So I'd love to talk about that. Um, biodiversity is basically, you know, the diversity of biology that is present when a plant is growing. And so terpenes can change the physiology of a plant as well as the plants around it. And so by increasing your biodiversity, you're influencing the amount of terpenes that can be created by a plant. So just to get it in something more simple that we can just like relate to, um, lavender, for instance, is super high in the terpene linalool. And linalool is one of those terpenes that is a plant to plant communicator. So when you plant lavender around other plants, they will increase their linalool production. Strawberries do the same thing. Now, certain terpenes though, um, communicate directly with microorganisms. And one of those is limonene. And so you can have fungal uh, mycelial network, those mycorrhiza fungus that are down there in the root zone, mutualistically helping the plant already with phosphorus uptake and all these other cool things. And it will help produce limonene if it knows that aphids are present because increased in limonene will um, ward off aphids. So if you've ever grown any plants that are super high in that limonene, I grew some lemon meringue last year and it was one of the only outdoor plants that wasn't hit with aphids because aphids do not like limonene. So it's just amazing that all of these different terpenes, while they are the communication tool of plants, they're also helping us. Um, they, these terpenes are studied and medicine known for reducing breast cancer cells, um, helping alleviate um, nausea from chemotherapy medication. Um, all different kinds of things happen because of terpenes. And I just think it's just so cool and what an opportunity we have to explore them more and talk about it. And I don't know any other, you know, person who's as interested in terpene as terpenes as cultivators. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of people, the, the medicinal plant that we know and love, uh, a lot of people grow it for the terpenes. And uh, it, it is super interesting that the microbes in the medium have an impact on it, right? A lot of people think it's just the nutrients that you feed the plant, giving it the nutrition it required, and the environment is going to adjust you know, the phenotypical expression of it. And that's going to actually help with the terpenes as far as development and so on and so forth. So what exactly, like, is there a specific consortium of microbes that will... Uh, you know, trigger certain terpenes to be developed or like, how, how does that work? And like, how can the grower control that? Or do they not have control of that? Um, okay, so this is the crazy thing is that terpenes are influenced by stress a lot of the times. So 
growing outside introduces a lot more diversity and stress. When you are outside, you have heat and cold and overwatering or underwatering or um, wind or pe more pests, all of these things increase terpene production. And so it's a little bit more about like, you know, losing control, I guess, <laughs> and allowing nature to run its course. Um, a lot of times we try to manipulate and control all of these aspects in our gardens and allowing nature to do its thing and know that plants can handle high temperatures. Plants can handle a lot of different stresses. And in fact, you're going to see an increase in these terpene productions if you kind of just take a step back and relax. If you do want to increase your terpene production and take an active role, I would suggest increasing your biodiversity and all aspects of things. So that would be things like cover cropping and companion planting because terpenes are influenced by root exudates, which give off sugars. So, you know, you think about photosynthesis and what is the byproduct? That is sugar. And the sugar is exudated through the roots, calling in different microorganisms. And in those root exudates are different terpenes. And so when you have different plants there, you have different terpenes, and then you have different microorganisms, and then you have an increase in production. And so really, um, I would suggest having a diversity in your inputs. So instead of using synthetic nutrients, using organic from a wide variety of sources, compost being uh, one of the best diversity of nutrients you can get, because think about all of those different um, inputs that are made, you know, that make up compost. It could be anything. And so when you want diversity, we are, you are what you eat and you want diversity in terpenes, then you want diversity in inputs. You want to have as much of that variety there so that you can increase your terpene production. Because most terpenes all start out with the same precursor and then they are synthesized into individual and unique terpenes according to what kind of food or stress or microorganisms are present. So really trying to increase that diversity through your nutrient inputs, through cover crop and companion planting, as well as increasing your microbial diversity. And like I said, I'm, I've been teaching these um, classes, like going hardcore, teaching living soil master classes across the country. Um, I've been to Tampa, Florida last weekend. I was in Chicago the month before. I was in Oklahoma City the month before that. And in every class, I ask people to bring soil samples so we can look at their microbes under a microscope. And predominantly, the samples that have the highest diversity in microorganisms are those that have living native soil, soil from outside in their grows. So if you wanna get diversity, go outside somewhere there's an established ecosystem, think old growth forest, somewhere that hasn't seen man destroy it, grab a scoop of soil, put that in an aerated compost soil tea, don't aerate too long, because you want diversity and put, go ahead and spread that in your garden and you're gonna see a huge increase in microbial diversity, which will then in turn increase your terpenes. What you said about cover crops, we'll back up here for a minute. What you said about cover crops is pretty interesting. It's impact on terpene production. Can we get deeper into cover crops a little bit? Because I myself have only used clover and uh, you know, very popular cover crop to use. And you, know, you hit on diversity of cover crops. What else can be used for cover crops that will be beneficial for, you know, to have it growing with medicinal plants? Well, this is where holistic management comes into play and holistically managing your garden, depending on what you need and what you're looking for. Um, so you have to ask yourself, like, what are your resources? How much space do you have available? How much time do you have to put into this? Because all of those answers are going to influence what I would suggest for a uh, cover crop. Um, some cover crops like buckwheat, which I use a lot outside, grow really quickly. 
So you can harvest and cut it down four times in a season. If you don't have the time or want to put in the effort of cutting back your cover crop constantly, then maybe you want something that's like a little bit more easy to manage, low growing, maybe like a creeping thyme, which if you look at like mammoth, peas, canna, troll, like a lot of these um, pest controls are thyme oil. So think about, look at what's in your IPM regimen and all of these bottled ingredients. And if there's peppermint, thyme, uh, citronella, oregano, stuff like that, those are great things to use as a cover crop because it's gonna be a pest deterrent. Also, if you like to cook, maybe you wanna incorporate some plants that you would cook with. There's really no right or wrong answer. It's just depending on your certain situation. So. For you, what like what's what's your garden like? What do you want to incorporate in there? That's a good question. I know, <laughs> you know, I, I want to retain water. Cover crops are known for water retention. I live in a, in the desert, a very very dry climate, and the top of the medium dries out super quickly. So when I'm growing with organic amendments, for example, when I'm top dressing in worm castings or compost or whatever, that top layer is drying out in this. So the microbes are going dormant. So having a cover crop in there is beneficial for me for water retention purposes. I also know that clover in particular is good for nitrogen fixation. Although I'm hearing some mixed information in regards to it. Some people say, yeah, it's great for nitrogen fixation, takes nitrogen from the air, puts into the f a form that the plant can uptake down in the medium. Some people say that bacteria needs to actually do that transformation there, right? And then some people say that takes a long time for that process to happen. So you could actually complete your entire grow of your medicinal plant and you haven't had any benefit. Is there any truth to that or, or what? Um, so clover is a legume in the legume family and it's all legume species, beans, um, peas, clover, that have this ability to fix nitrogen, like you said, from the atmosphere, but they do rely on a symbiotic relationship with rhizobia, a bacteria that will form root nodules on the root zone, and they will pull the nitrogen out of the atmosphere. You do have to have those nitrogen fixing bacteria present. So if you inoculate your seeds with this bacteria, you're good to go. If you're outside, those bacteria are plentiful and you don't need to inoculate, they will come. And a, a cool way to know is just pull up uh, an established legume and look at the roots. And are there little white nodules on those root hairs? And if they are, then you have the bacteria there and the nitrogen is being fixed. It does take a while for that to happen. And so this is more of like, um, you know, an, an overwinter kind of a thing. If you're outside, plant a legume or clover species that is going to last all winter long, and then you can chop it down and let it mix back in, cover it with mulch, compost, that kind of thing. Um, you do want to cut back your legumes when they're about 50% into flower. Once 50% of them have begun flowering, that's the time that you're going to want to cut back any cover crop. Um, this is because they will start pulling that nitrogen back out of the soil and storing it in their seeds. Once they start seed production, you're going to start losing the nitrogen that you want to fix into your soil. So I would suggest any kind of legume nitrogen fixing cover crop to be something that was put in place over winter or while you're not cultivating to really harness the benefits of it. Um, if you did want a fast fixing nitrogen plant to grow while you were cultivating, cow peas would be a great suggestion for you in a hot climate with a lack of water. So that along with the buckwheat, those are two that do really well together. And buckwheat will pull phosphorus out of the soil that is insoluble and turn it into a soluble form. Um, there's so many amazing cover crops though. It's really like, you know, play with it. See how it does for you. Try new things. Now, what about recommendations for, like, I'm just a small indoor grower, right? And I'm usually in smaller containers. So do you have any recommendations for like, for me, as far as keeping a cover crop within a small container, whether it be a three gallon, five gallon, seven gallon, something like that, is there any difference in kind of having cover crops in smaller containers versus larger containers or beds, for example? Yeah, I mean, with a smaller container, it's just not as much room for error. 
and you have to keep re-amending with nutrients. And so honestly, for a smaller container, I would probably just go with a mulch instead of trying to cover crop. Um, and instead, maybe take your um, practices of cover cropping outside and try an outdoor garden. I'm sure that you have a yard, hopefully. Um, and <laughs> not really, actually the desert is like, really there's, there's nothing, there's, there's no yard nothing. back here at all. No, it's just dirt. <laughs> Dang, where are you located? In Las Vegas. Okay. All right. Well, natives plants, native species, that's always the go-to when you're in an area that doesn't have a lot of water. I would always recommend a native species because they evolved with the environment there. Um, but for indoors, I would really recommend cover crops on larger containers. Um, I just got a grassroots fabric four by eight bed. Shout out grassroots. Thank you for sending that to me for free. Um, and I'm going to be experimenting with different cover crops inside um, in a tent to grow four by eight. And so I'll have more information for you on how that works out inside. I mean, I'm just transitioning from a 5,000 square foot canopy in a greenhouse outside to a four by eight tent inside. So it's gonna be a huge scale down and really applying things that home growers can use a lot more easily than if you had, you know, tons of room outside to just throw seeds and plants everywhere. Got it, okay. And then you mentioned companion planting as well can have an impact on terpenes. Can you talk about that? What companion plants would you recommend? And you know, when would you plant them as well? I think that's, that's one thing I'd like to know. Yeah, so I would start them earlier um, and just companion planting for terpene production is definitely something that obviously you're gonna wanna grow alongside your medicinal plants. Um, so strawberries are a great one. You can plant strawberries and they will just keep on spreading. The thing with strawberries is that you're gonna want to take the mother plant out after um, a couple of seasons. So basically you'll get a few um, strawberry plants throw them into your bed and they will reproduce and send off little rhizome shoots and that will have a baby strawberry plant. And so you will continue getting fruit off of your main strawberry, your mother plant for two, three years. But after that, it really slows down and you're gonna wanna take those mother plants out and just keep on cultivating the babies. Um, they spread like wildfire. Have you ever grown strawberries? Yeah, my mother has up in New Hampshire. She has this, and they have spread like crazy. It's uh, it's amazing. You can sit there and harvest them, and then all of a sudden, a day later, you can harvest more. It's nuts. Yeah, it's amazing. And so that's something that's a great ground cover, cover crop, companion plant, and that will increase linalool production in your other plants. So that's an amazing com companion plant to go with. Um, like I mentioned earlier, lavender as well. Um, if you're outside and you have room, yarrow is one that you could do. Um, I mean, there's really, you can just play with it, but things that are really floral and sweet smelling are going to be that linalool and that will be an increase in terpene production. Um, other companion plants are great like pest deterrents, like I mentioned, thyme or peppermint, which mint spreads like fire as well. So be careful about where you plant your mint because it will take off and you think you put it in a container and it finds a way to climb out of that container. So um, be careful. Uh, comfrey and borage are also excellent companion plants. And those are plants also that you may want to plant um, outside or only if you have a really large container because they can get quite large. Um, the great thing about comfrey is that it is like this bioaccumulator, um, it, meaning that it pulls up a lot of the nutrients that are in the soil really readily and it stores them in their leaves and it makes these huge beautiful leaves that you can just chop and drop right on your soil creating a free nutrient, a mulch, um, it's an excellent source of minerals, um, a little bit of NPK in there. So that would be something that um, I could recommend as a companion plant. Borage is related to comfrey. It's a little bit smaller. The bees love it. If you're outside, it's an amazing pollinator attractant. 
Um, but then you also need to be careful about what pests you could be bringing into your garden when you do companion planting. That's always something to be aware of. So just think about like, you know, oh, look at this beautiful butterfly. Well, what do butterflies do? They lay eggs that turn into caterpillars. Um, what do caterpillars do? They munch through plants creating trails for botrytis. So, um, you know, it's a holistic approach of looking when you are playing with other species and creating your own ecosystem. Uh, you really want to just be aware and try and educate yourself on what you're doing. Or ask me. Send me a DM on Instagram. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned chop and drop, and I do have a lot of new folks that tune into this podcast. Can you explain exactly what chop and drop is and how it's beneficial? Yes. So chop and drop is pretty simple. It is just chopping the plant down and dropping it where it lays. And this is um, the best example I can give you is when you mow your lawn. Do not put the bag on your lawnmower. That right there, all of those grass clippings are full of nitrogen. In fact, 15% of the nitrogen your lawn requires can come from your grass clippings, reducing your need for nitrogen fertilizer. And, f and if you allow your grass to grow a little bit longer, you're gonna get more nitrogen when you cut it. My neighbors are always bothering me. Now that I live in a neighborhood, they're like, oh, when are you gonna mow your lawn? I'm like, well, when I feel like it, because that's nitrogen, that's free nitrogen right there. I'm waiting for it to get to that height before I chop and drop. And just to clarify, you said, you know, chop the plant down, put it there. You're talking about like the cover crop, for example, or you could even take like the leaves off yep. of like some people, the defoliation technique off of their plant. They can just drop those leaves right down onto the surface, right? Exactly. Right there. When you're defoliating, you can just leave the leaves unless you have a pest problem, obviously. Um, but allowing it to just break down in your soil surface is just going to add back the nitrogen you think of nitrogen with green growth. Um, when we talked about composting in our last episode, we talked about the different inputs that you need for composting and that's nitrogen and carbon. And so whenever there is green left in a plant, that's nitrogen present. And so when you allow your plant matter to decay on the surface, it is going to feed your soil and then your plants with nitrogen. Bacteria love organic, fresh organic matter like leaf litter. So bacteria are gonna come up and they're gonna feed off of that nitrogen source. And once the green is gone, it becomes brown and that's carbon. And then the carbon feeds the fungus. It's amazing, it's a full circle of life there. I was going to ask you if anything is lost when you lay that down on top and it starts to brown up. I was going to ask you if you're losing the nitrogen or not, but you're saying the bacteria is basically coming up to the leaf taking all the nitrogen and bringing it down into the medium? Yep, exactly. And nitrogen is a mobile nutrient, meaning it moves with water. So when you have any runoff and there's green leaf matter there, um, or any nitrogen that is mobile in your soil, you are seeing that nitrogen leave and run out of your pot. Um, so really with the whole living soil um, system, you don't really want a ton of runoff. Um, anytime you have runoff, mobile nutrients are attaching to hydrogen molecules in the water and leaving your container. And that is why in the United States, we see a lot of eutrophication in our waterways. And that is a buildup or excess of nitrogen and phosphorus. And that can be detrimental to water ecosystems. Yeah, toxic algae blooms, right? So exactly. that's uh, this is terrible, terrible for the environment. Yep. I do want to back up a little bit when you, you, you kind of touched upon this is like stressing the plant is going to help with terpene production. And it's funny, I just released a uh, video not too long ago where it was film my garden inside in my grow tent. And I pointed out that the plant that was right next to the fan seemed to have more trichome production than the other plants that were further away from the plant. 
uh, further away from the fan, sorry. And uh, that is a form of stress, right? Wind stress is a form of stress that can certainly help increase trichome production within the trichomes of the terpenes, cannabinoids, so on and so forth. What other forms of stress can you get into that will really help with terpene production? Yeah, um, heat stress will definitely be one of them. Um, That actually is also known to increase THC content, um, the higher the temperatures. There's a lot of studies done in Israel that are um, taking this data and showing different, the same exact clone, strain, everything, and putting it through heat stress, and they're seeing higher levels of terpenes and higher levels of THC in there. Um, It is kind of like a... um, sunblock. The plant creates its own sunblock by increasing those um, trichome heads to protect it from UV radiation. How are they, like, from my understanding, you, you mentioned this in the beginning of the episode, t- terpenes volatize, right? So that what that's what you're smelling. Now, when you're increasing the temperature, are you at risk of losing some of those terpenes because they're volatizing off the plant? Are you doing the t- heat stress for a short period of time so it doesn't, so you don't aren't losing terpenes or, or what? Um, when your plant is alive and it's creating terpenes, um, you don't really need to worry about losing them to oxidation like you would if it was cut. You don't want to introduce heat stress to a, like when you're drying your plant. Terpenes are volatile that they will combust above 69 degrees. Um, there are terpenes that that is like that is as high as they can get before they burn off. But when you have a plant that is alive and it's synthesizing terpenes constantly, um, you're not going to see those terpenes gone forever. The plant is actively responding to nature. Its physiology is changing according to what's happening to it. It's living, breathing like you and me. um, And think about, you know, like maybe when you're hot and you're running and you sweat, your sweat's kind of stinky. That's like a terpene, <laughs> kind of in a way, just to think about. So basically, you're you're generating more terpenes than you're losing is kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Gotcha. And then I guess storage is another thing. We were talking about conserving the terpenes on the storage. I think a lot of people make the mistake of not having the proper temperature and humidity as far for storage. I think a lot of people aim after that, you know, 62%. Some people say 58% relative humidity within the actual container. But a lot of people are ignoring the actual temperature that they're storing in. So, I mean, right now it's high 70s low 80s just in my house if i were to have flour right here arguably i'm losing some of those terpenes right so is there like a a certain temperature that you stick towards for storage oh yeah i definitely try and keep it under 69 degrees um in a cool dark place a great location is the bathroom in your closet in a dark closet that's typically where i will store it because you're going to have that constant humidity from showering in there and keeping it back up Um, bringing that RH, that relative humidity back to a 50, 60%, it'll boost up to 90% when the door is closed with the water running in the shower, but it dissipates down and depending where you're living, obviously this would influence whether or not you keep it in the bathroom. If you live in a place like Florida or Oklahoma where the outside is already 85% humidity, you don't really need to introduce more humidity in that form. But where you're at in Las Vegas or where I'm at in Washington, Idaho, um, it can be a lot drier and you might want to reintroduce those, that humidity. But really trying to keep the temperature um, between 60 and 70 degrees is ideal. Um, Anytime you go over 68 degrees, you're starting to lose terpenes. What about storing in like your refrigerator, which is lower than 60 degrees or even some people put in the freezer? Is there any harm being done with that? Um, well, I have a funny story about that. Um, so a few years ago, um, when I was licensed in California, I had done an entire indoor grow. It was probably like 30 pounds of flour that was frozen for, uh, concentrate production. I was going to be taking it to a lab and they were going to turn it into a BHO product. Uh, And 
I decided, well, me and my partner decided to end our business relationship and we needed to um, sell all of our product and liquidate assets. And so I thought, well, we're not going to take this to the lab and go through the processing. Uh, I'm just going to open up this bag, this vacuum sealed bag that's been in the freezer for a few months and see what the flower is like. And um, it was kind of like, you know, those little peanuts from pa like packing and packaging, like little styrofoam peanuts. That's yeah. how it felt. Um, it had lost a lot of moisture and it was really like dry and weird texture. Um, it still smelled great, but the moisture level was very strange from being in a freezer. Um, and I don't know if that's because the moisture gets pulled out into ice and you know, like condensate. And that's why you start seeing like freezer burn on things like that. Cause whatever moisture is in there gets pulled out. Um, so I would digress and do not put it in the freezer if you have an other option. Um, the refrigerator tends to be super humid and smell is weird. And I don't know if I would put them, maybe if you had a refrigerator that was specifically for flour, um, but really keeping it at below 70 degrees. Most of us have air conditioning and have our houses at 70 degrees. That's your best bet, somewhere dark. Um, and having a good cure is really going to preserve your terpenes because when you don't cure it properly and maybe you um, don't burp it, allow, let out the off-gassing, opening it up, and even opening it up in, uh, brings in carbon dioxide from our breath which can influence the curing process. All of these things influence how the terpenes are going to be preserved. So getting to that point, storing it in your home at a nice, like if it's 72, I mean, it's not really, you're not gonna lose a ton of them. I wouldn't stress too much about it. I would be more worried about putting it in the refrigerator or the freezer than a 72 degree house. I actually have put it into a wine fridge set to 60 degrees. Perfect. So, yeah, it seems like it's working pretty good so far. I've been using it for about six months or something like that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I have it in glass jars, which obviously, you know, getting the temperature into the glass jar to be the same. There's, there's a slow process there, but then those Grove bags, I'm also using those as well now and put them into the, the fridge. But it seems like it's working to conserve them for a longer period of time, you know? Yeah, and a wine fridge is different than like a regular food fridge. So I would say wine is all about temperature and preserving terpenes and flavor in that bottle and not allowing it to oxidize. So that's a great option. I didn't even think about wine fridges. So that's pretty cool. You got to have, those are kind of expensive though. So true. Yeah. <laughs> You're spending a lot of money on those. I actually got a gift it to me. I was lucky enough. Somebody was throwing them away. So I was like, yeah, I'll take it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Your wine fridge turned in your plant medicine fridge. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so what else do we need to know about terpenes? Did you want to go over like some of the different terpenes and how they affect us? Or what other things with terpenes did you kind of want to cover on this episode? I mean, all of the terpenes, all terpenes are good for you, right? They all have different properties. Um, really, it's just... The fact that terpenes um, played this important role in plant um, communication through plant insect, plant pathogen, uh, plant to plant interaction. I have been doing some research and it's pretty cool when you have the, like we talked about companion planting. One study um, showed that cyanide was released by cassava plants um, that were planted next to peanut plants. And this caused the peanut roots to release ethylene, which is a plant growth hormone. Um, and it altered the rhizosphere and increased the actinobacteria. And so it's just amazing how plants can use terpenes. We just, we just don't give them enough credit, I don't think. And that's really what I want to, you know, hit home here is that yes we love terpenes because of the way they smell but 
what they do for plants and how they can call in bacteria, how certain plants can put off scents to ward off insects, or how a plant can communicate with fungus, with mycorrhizal fungus, and by releasing a certain terpene and telling that fungus, hey, we're stressed out, we don't have enough water. And you know what that, that fungus can do? It can communicate to any plant that is within its mycelial network and let it know, hey man, maybe there's a tree on the other side of the forest that that fungus is tapped into. And it can say, well, this tree over here on the other side of the forest is starting to dry out. And you know what happens when they dry out? The bark beetles come. So you guys over there, let's increase our turpentine, which is actually where the word terpene comes from is turpentine, which is a specific terpene that's found in pine trees. So this is true, like the mycorrhizal fungus will go ahead and it will hear, hear, I mean I'm saying hear, but what I'm meaning is it, it just is listening to the tree's terpenes and it can sense this and it can say, okay, I'm dried out, this tree's dried out, I'm gonna communicate down to the tree on the other side of the forest and tell it, hey, the drought's coming, that means bark beetles are coming, increase your turpentine, and that is gonna ward off the beetles. It's just amazing, and I really, really hope that everyone will just give terpenes a little bit more credit, and in turn, they will support their sun-grown cultivators who are allowing their plants to live their most plant life with the most biodiversity and the most terpenes, and that is why sun-grown is superior to indoor. I'm sorry, you're an indoor grower, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. No, you mentioned uh, it, it's super interesting with, with fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, how that works with the whole system underground and, and so on and so forth. I watched the documentary Fantastic Fungi. I don't know if oh, you've yeah. seen that one or not, but incredible documentary. It talks a lot about that, the mycelium network that's under the ground and all that stuff. But that kind of leads into what I want to talk about next, which is something I saw on your YouTube channel, which I just realized you have a YouTube channel. I didn't know you had one. And it's a video that you just recently put out that relates to what we're talking about, which is the back bacteria to fungi ratio in the actual medium. And uh, like you mentioned, they do have an impact on terpenes. And uh, I didn't know there were test kits out there. So on your video, you actually have a test kit that you got. You're able to take a sample and you're actually able to find out the fungal to bacteria ratio. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So that is a microbiometer and that was my first time using it. Um, super cool, nifty tool. Um, it is very influenced by um, microorganisms and microbial products. So I have heard that you should, I mean, and this should be kind of common sense, but don't buy it and test your amendment or your soil or your medium right after you've applied a microbial product because it's going to skew the test results and you may be like, oh wow, I have such high percentage of microbial biomass. Um, so really it's a good baseline test kit so you can test your medium um, at the end of the cycle or the beginning of the cycle not right when you have applied any microbial product so in this case we went ahead and took a soil sample you can see it in the video right outside in um, one of my Patreon's gardens, which is so cool. Patreon has connected me to actual people where I get to go and help them on their farm and make real friends that are like my best friends for life now. <laughs> um, so <laughs> patreon.com slash queen of the sun grown, yo. Um, but we went ahead and we took this microbiometer, took a sample, and you put it in the test tube, shake it up with a little bit of I don't know, they give you a little packet of powder that you put in with the water and you shake it, let it sit for 20 minutes and you put it on this slide and you take a picture with your phone. It's so mind blowing. I don't understand technology. I don't get it. I don't understand how a phone can take a picture of a little test slide with the soil sample, the water, and the powder, chemical powder, and analyze the microbial biomass that is present in that sample. It's mind-blowing to me. What can't phones do? 
really. Um, That's wild. So microbiometer, uh, how much do those things cost and where can people get those? Um, microbiometer.com and they cost, I believe, 135 to $150. And it comes with a ton of test testers. So it should last you like many, many, many cycles. I think there's like 20 um, test tube things in there that you can test. 20 tests or something like that. Um, but besides the microbial biomass, it also gives you your bacteria to fungi ratio. And so... Um, there's a lot of debate about plant, the medicinal plant in question, um, and it being fungally dominant, preferring a fungally dominant um, medium. And so, like, I haven't seen scientific evidence that suggests that it needs to be fungally dominant. Um, when you think of what associates with fungus, um, what plants need it? It's plants that live a really, really long time, like trees, because fungus is a very slow growing um, organism, whereas bacteria is like this boom and bust. So when you see a disturbance in an ecosystem, such as a fire or a road grade being cut out, um, any kind of disturbance to that ecosystem that has destroyed and taken away the plants, you're going to start seeing um, an increase in bacteria really quickly. They're the first species to come in and they're associated with grasses and herbaceous plants that are fast growing. That's why you'll see the legumes at road cuts like lupin or hairy vetch growing along borders of fences because there's been a disturbance there. And then when you start looking for fungus, it's in older, developed ecosystems where there's old growth trees. And that's why we, as gardeners and farmers, practice no-till because anytime you till, you're disturbing the ecosystem and you are pushing it toward a bacterial dominance. Now, with the plant in question, I would say that having a good balance of both is more important than trying to assert dominance by fungus over bacteria. The only reason I can see that you would want more fungal dominance over bacterial is that bacterial slime raises your pH and this plant likes a slightly ericaceous or acidic soil similar to azaleas or blueberries, um, between a 5.8 and a 6.2. And so fungus grows in a slightly acidic soil. And that would be my only deduction of why you may want slightly more fungus is to help with the pH balance of your medium. Got it. Yeah, I know there's a lot of controversy behind the medicinal plant, whether or not it is fungal dominant or bacteria dominant, which one the plant prefers. So if they get the test results and they find out they're dominant one way or the other, what do you recommend? Would, you, would they just find a microbial inoculant that kind of leans towards the way that they're trying to go? I wouldn't uh, recommend any products because okay. I am not a product person. I would recommend... Um, creating the environment or habitat that is best suited for the organism that you are looking for. So with fungus, we would, if you would like to in see an increase in your, your fungal population, you're going to want to provide the fungus with food, which is uh, complex carbohydrates. Fungus love grains, straw, mulch, those kinds of things. So you're going to want to cover your soil surface with a mulch, um, whether it's uh, straw or rice hulls or bark, um, something like that, that is where you're going to see an increase in water retention because fungus also really likes moisture. Think about where they grow in the PNW, Pacific Northwest, um, places that see a lot of rain. And so increasing your soil moisture is going to help influence that fungal dominance or fungal ratio. Um, if you want to see more bacteria, then feed your soil simple carbohydrates, such as yucca, 
um, molasses, brown sugar, brown cane sugar. Um, basically, bacteria love sugar, and so if you can increase the diversity of the sugars, either by introducing them through a tea, or like we talked about, root exudates of different species of plants, specifically legumes and things of that nature, then you will increase your bacterial um, ratio. But just inoculating isn't going, sure, you're going to have a bunch for a week or a day, but is it going to germinate? Is it going to thrive? So many soil samples that I've looked at under a microscope have tons of fungal spores, but the spores haven't germinated. The spores are still closed. They're not growing. And so why is that? Well, they don't have mulch. They don't have enough water. They don't have the right environment. So really, if you want to see more fungus or more bacteria, you're going to want to give them the habitat that they want to live in. I love it. Really, really great information. You know, you really are an inspiration when it comes to the whole regenerative gardening side of things. And, uh, you know, hats off to you for, for doing what you do as far as your movement with the classes and, and so on and so forth. We are getting towards the end of the episode here. And there's one question I like to ask towards the end of almost every episode. Like I mentioned, we have a lot of beginners that are tuned into this podcast. And I like to ask the guests, what advice do you have for beginners? Make observations. Pay attention really write things down. Have a journal or a calendar and anytime you do anything, just write it down, the date that you did it, and then take a look at your plant every day and just be like, oh, you know, the leaves, the edges of my leaves look a little serrated today. What could that mean? Maybe it's a little stressed or perhaps there's a little bit of a canoeing or tacoing where it's bending in at that uh, marginal vein right in the center. Um, just make observations, write it down, and then if you start having any problems, you can go back and look at your notes and you can deduce right away or you can have the information ready to ask somebody who might know better. Awesome. Yeah. Good advice there. So wrapping things up, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? You can find me on Instagram at Queen of the Sun Grown. You can find me on YouTube Queen of the Sun Grown as well, and Patreon, Queen of the Sun Grown. I also had my website, you can, Queen of the Sun Grown, you get the idea, pretty repetitive here. Um, I will be continuing traveling the country, educating people, and trying to save the planet one compost pile at a time, and you can find me in Denver, September 17th, at the coffee joint, doing a Living Soil Masterclass. Um, as well as San Diego, October 1st at Mighty Hydro. Um, And then after that, I'll be at Indoor Gardens in Buffalo, New York, October 22nd. And you can buy tickets um, at growcastpodcast.com forward slash classes. Go ahead and check that out. And you can find me there just traveling the country talking about microbes. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the description section below on YouTube and uh, Instagram too. I'll link that down there as well. So you guys can easily scroll down to the description section, click on that link and give her a follow on Instagram or subscription on YouTube. Newer channel. I know you don't do too much on YouTube as of right now, but I did see one recent video. So hope that you'll be continuing to create that content because there's just so much good information that you can expel to the audience here. So once again, thank you so much for coming on to this podcast today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You as well. All right. Peace out, everyone. See you in the next episode. Happy gardening.